there are two movements that are going to dominate this series of videos and this period of the turn of the century. They are arts and crafts and art nouveau and they overlap in so many ways, but I'm going to try and parse them out as best I can, uh, keeping in mind that again, they do tend to overlap. So we're going to start with the arts and crafts movement. Now, the arts and crafts movement is a reaction against what they see as poorly manufactured, mass-produced furniture. Now, as I said before, what frequently happens when I am mass producing something is I'm going to produce it and find a cheap way to create it. Makes a lot of sense. And of course, mass manufacturing doesn't allow for certain elements, especially early on. Things like mortise and tenon construction is much more difficult for a machine to do. So what I might do is I might have say a side of a piece of furniture, here I'm just gonna draw two sticks. And the traditional method of course would be mortise and tenon where uh, one element would actually come in and be incorporated into the other. Here's my little mortise and tenon. Instead, what we're frequently going to see is butt joints. So we're going to see a joint like this where the two pieces simply come together and they run a screw through to hold it. Now, that's fantastic. It will hold, but not nearly as well. And it is prone to falling out or breaking. Of course, this becomes a weak joint. So that's what they're arguing against. And this is especially going to happen in Britain. Uh, it's going to be pushed by a couple of prime characters, really. Uh, John Ruskin. Now, Ruskin is an art critic. He's come up in the past and he's coming up again. He was a big one in favor of the idea that interiors should simplify, that you should only have the pieces that are really utilitarian, that they should be built to last, that they should be individually crafted. He felt that there was something missing. And you'll remember that he came up the last time when we were talking about Victorian architecture because he liked the revival ideas, the idea that we can use new technology to attack old problems and build within those styles because they are somehow superior. And he's applying the same idea here to furniture, saying that the old ideas are superior. We will also see William Morris. Now he's a decorator, an architect. He has a he does a lot of different things. Uh, and he's going to create furniture amongst other things, furniture design. Now he will be key because he's kind of the intellectual base of the entire arts and crafts movement. He's the person who kind of gets it rolling. So he's a key player. But both of them acknowledge that old forms, looking back, for example, at the Gothic, at the medieval, at the Renaissance, are probably the way to go. And so in Europe, in arts and crafts, that's frequently what you're going to see. Pieces that harken back to the days of the Gothic. And in this period, they are really romanticizing that via the romantic movement that's happening in the middle of the 19th century in art. But it's also happening in literature. This is where we see a lot of those stories of chivalry, of course, stories that never really could have happened in the medieval, if you're familiar with the history. But these are the stories that people are being surrounded with. And so they want furniture based on many of those ideals. Now, in the U.S., we will see what's called the craftsman style, which is not going to harken back to these old ideas of the medieval and the Gothic. We don't have that same history in the U.S. at this point. In fact, 1876, the U.S. is only 100 years old. There's not a lot of great history there. So they harken back to a lot of styles and ideas that we saw from colonial America. Uh, they're also going to borrow new ideas. So... For example, a craftsman style interior will have a lot of stained glass. We see built in carpentry. We see extensive use of wood and exposed beams and other elements. Now, the objectives of the arts and crafts movement, there are really two key objectives. One is to create aesthetically pleasing functional objects, but they should not be overly decorated. 
which we're going to see. We're going to see that simplification of surface ornamentation, very much the opposite of what we saw, for example, in the Rococo and the Baroque. Now, they're also going to seek to enrich the lives, and this is very important, of both the artisan and the consumer. Because the idea behind arts and crafts is that the artisan should spend extra time to handcraft a piece. Or the machines that are helping should be heavily controlled and creating a high quality piece. That way, it enriches the life of the consumer because it's a high quality piece. It doesn't have to be replaced. It looks aesthetically pleasing. It adds to their life. And for the artisan, they're being paid a reasonable living wage. That's a key element. That's where Marxism kind of plays into a lot of what's going on here. That idea that we need to properly pay, properly uh take care of the artisan that's creating the pieces that beautify our space. 